Okay, so we're recording the session. Um, I think I've met most of you. I recognize the vast majority of names. There's a few of you that perhaps didn't uh, manage to make our face-to-face uh, -face induction. I hope you've worked through the materials. Um, the purpose of the webinars really is to try and provide you with uh, a more personable uh, interaction around the readings and around the lecture. So generally there's an expectation that you would have engaged with the reading before the session so that you're at least familiar with some of the approaches that we're taking or some of the language that we're using um, because I don't tend to take a lot of time out to explain concepts. So generally it's expected that you will have done the reading first. And as I say, we would hope increasingly that these sessions will become interactive. One of the ways that we are able to do that is to basically uh, pull in polls and take polls out um, and so there's a certain amount of interaction just by asking you questions. So I'm going to start by doing that now. Um, I'd actually like to just ask uh, a relatively simple question, um, which is whether or not you are uh, aware of people already doing the PG cert. So first question is, have you spoken to anyone doing the PG CPE already about their experiences? Are you aware of somebody doing the course? You want some of those ideas today. I think many of you have already reacted very well to the Peter Kugel reading that you've done. Um, I think it's a really excellent reading. It's very accessible, very simple. And I'm going to share some other very simple ideas with you today. So the webinars bring together um, the readings and the lecture, but they also attempt to try and uh, address directly one of the objectives. So you'll see in each topic we have three, four, or five objectives. In module one, we're fairly consistent. We have four objectives, I think, each week. And one of those objectives is simply to examine how teachers learn about teaching and how they develop. And so what I want you to do right away is on a piece of paper, I'm not going to ask you to type this response to me at the moment. You don't need to type anything. But on a piece of paper uh, somewhere, uh, or if you're sitting somewhere and you're completely uh, digital, um, type it in another window, complete this sentence um, for me because we're going to come back to this idea in, in a little while. Just complete the sentence that my priority as a teacher, what's your priority as a teaching practitioner? And it is broken down in, in this tabular form. And what I'm going to ask um, you to do is to think about how the statement that you wrote down might equate to these um, different approaches. So have a look at the statement that you wrote and ask yourself, I'm not going to broadcast the results just yet, but ask yourself whether you would classify your current approach as being primarily focused around information transmission focused around concept acquisition, around conceptual development, or around conceptual change. What's your intention? And is your strategy teacher-focused, student-teacher interaction-orientated, or student-focused? And this isn't, this isn't about you proving anything to me, so it's about you being very honest with yourself about where your practice is. I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Thank you for that. Thank you for your uh, participation. That's good to know. I'm going to close that poll and hide it, put it out of the way. So I think this particular work is simply one way of uh, classifying the, the, the teaching that takes place, classifying attitudes to teaching that takes place. But if, if what we think about teaching has a direct impact on our learners, then those of us who are teaching in a way that is perhaps still very focused on us and is focused around information transition, if that's what we think is the current learning that we're doing, then the chances are that that's what the students are going to be getting. That's what they're going to be experiencing. And it's quite a challenge to break outside those boundaries. So this relates very closely, I hope most of you. Actually, just a show of hands, again, I'm not going to pick on anyone, who has had the chance to read the Google article. Can you just put your hand up if you have read it? How many people have already had a chance to look at the reading? 
So quite a few of you. Okay, that that's good. Thank you for that. That's great, great to know. In fact, the majority of you. So that's terrific. Examples are you giving for those answers to be tested between students? Do you ask a question and then get the students to talk about it and give you one answer, or do you get them to go through a process of testing their own answers? For example, so it's useful to have uh, an, an illustration like this, I think, because it helps you break down, if you like, what you're actually doing in practice. Now, I, I think this becomes interesting when you think about your examples of collaboration, because you said to me, by and large, with the exception of presentations, you mentioned wikis, you mentioned presentations, but, but three of the responses were directly about conversation. And so my question then is, and let's put the dialogue box back up, my question is, what's the nature of that conversation? So where does that conversation take place? Thinking about the complexity that one could represent as a Lorillard uh, schematic, where is the conversation actually taking place? So one of the questions is, OK, so you can do that with text. You can present text in a different way. And if you think about it, you can be presenting text in a meaningful way by thinking about the spatial relationships between the points that you want to make. But you might also want to represent this idea that information is layered. And because this is a program that stores information in Flash, very obviously at the moment, you can't see, I would expect, the text that's in the bottom right hand corner. I don't want you to. I don't want you to read that text because I'm talking to you about the text that's on the screen at the moment. Are you 100% sure that people at the back can actually see them? Because very often the visuals are not um, always chosen well or effectively. And I think there's a need also finally for people to get into the habit of describing what's on the slide. So actually saying, I'm showing you four images of X. Um, and if you don't do that, then obviously you're also not necessarily navigating individuals through. Now, that some of those are quite personal to me, perhaps, and you might feel quite different about them. The, the final comment is about jargon. So jargon, acronyms, idioms. And people will often say, well, that's the professional environment that they're going to work in. They have to get their head around it. And I think all I would say is in the way that I have here where I might be talking to a class and I might say jargon, acronyms and idioms and expect that perhaps quite a few people are not 100% sure what an idiom is. I think where that's true, I would put a definition on the screen. So this is one of the few reasons why I would put text on a screen is that I'm anticipating that there might be a need for definition or clarification. Characteristics of poor presentations that you've seen, not suggesting for one moment that these are things you've done yourself, but what do you think represents a poor presentation in a learning and teaching context? What have you seen that you thought didn't work? A mind map that has the word presentation technologies in the middle of it, and then a series of, of boxes around the outside. Mind maps are very interesting uh, from the point of view of teaching, certainly from classroom teaching point of view. If any of you are using interactive whiteboards um, in the classroom, you will be able to get a sense of how this could work as a physical resource in the classroom. This is actually a shockwave file. So a student can be sent this file in exactly the form it is now, and it is possible for, for the individual then to click around it and to navigate. What I wanted to do was to kind of talk you through some of the issues that I think are important around presentation technologies and to, to do so by using various technologies, which I thought was a good way of doing it. I do have a caveat. And as you can see here, there are notes. So at various points in the presentation, I'm not going to ask you to read it. Uh, at various points in the presentation, there are these notes. So this becomes a standalone resource for someone who's accessing this later. Anyone coming to this presentation is basically seeing not a transcript of what I'm saying, but essentially covering much of the same of the same ground. And I'm going to come to why I'm not leaving those words on the screen for you to read uh, in just a second. So in terms of the, the, the caveat for this session, I just want us to be very, very clear that nothing that I'm doing uh, in this technology and health learning series, and we've got some guests coming in later in the series, nothing that we're going to do is about telling you to change your practice and do something different in a very immediate way. A lot of us are very constrained by the environment that we work in or supported, depending on your point of view, and we may actually be given our PowerPoints in advance. We may actually have our PowerPoints prepared by externals or by SMEs, uh, and we aren't in a position to just change them uh, at will.
So this isn't about saying to you, look at the material you've got, how can you improve it immediately? But it certainly would give you an opportunity to have a conversation with SMEs and with designers and with other people uh, and to think about the presentations that you do make and how you might make them.